Good morning. I'm Mark Agrast, Executive Director of the American Society of International Law. I'd like to welcome you to this special event on Joseph Raz and International Law, an Unfinished Journey, presented by the ASIL International Legal Theory Interest Group and our colleagues at the Borderline Jurisprudence Podcast. I'd like to extend a special welcome to those of you who may be new to the society. As you know, uh, as you may know, ASIL is a nonprofit, nonpartisan educational membership organization founded in 1906 and chartered by the US Congress in 1950. Its mission is to foster the study of international law and to promote international relations on the basis of law and justice. We invite you to join the society to have full access to all of our meetings, publications, interest group activities, and the other benefits of membership. In a few minutes, I'll introduce our co-moderators for this session. But first, I've been asked to say a few words about the person we honor today, who happened to be one of my tutors during my Oxford days. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to reminisce and to share some recollections of him. When I arrived in Oxford, it was an exciting place to be for a young would-be philosopher. One was apt to encounter such luminaries as Isaiah Berlin, Charles Taylor, Iris Murdoch, A.J. Ayer, Ronald Dworkin, and H.L.A. Hart. My supervisor, Alan Ryan, recommended that I undertake a set of tutorials with Joseph Raz, who was then at Balliol and was all of 39 years old. I was all of 23 years old. At the time we met, he had not yet become the renowned authority on jurisprudence that he would later become. He had not yet published his great book, The Morality of Freedom, which would be hailed by the Times Literary Supplement as a new statement of liberal principles as significant as anything since Mills on Liberty. He did not even yet have his great philosopher's beard. On the morning of our first session, I presented him, I presented myself at his rooms, essay in hand. He greeted me with few preliminaries invited me to sit down and to read out my essay. I no longer recall anything of what I wrote. What I do recall is that he questioned everything. Why think this, he would ask, unwilling to take for granted even the most straightforward expressions and ideas. By the end of the hour, in his gentle, soft-spoken way, he had demolished every one of my arguments. I was not prepared for this, and I took it rather hard. Only later did I learn that this was what one should expect from a session with Joe Raz, a fierce insistence on linguistic and logical precision and zero tolerance for intellectual laziness. Even his most celebrated students admitted to being terrified, as one of them put it, shell-shocked by his fierce scrutiny. Eventually, I came to realize that his pedagogical rigor was not simply a style of teaching, but rather an expression of his respect for his students and their potential. More than that, it was an embodiment of his morality. Although my time with him was relatively brief, his moral rigor stayed with me. I hope some of it rubbed off. Even as I write these words, I can hear him thinking, what do you mean? Why do you think this? Just before my arrival in Oxford, Raz co-edited a collection of essays with PMS Hacker in honor of uh, H.L.A. Hart's 70th birthday. In their preface, they write that Hart, quote, has been a forceful spokesman for the liberal tradition in morals and politics. The endeavor to strike a judicial, judicious balance between the liberty of the individual and the social good lies at the core of his political morality. Much the same could be said for the place that Joseph Raz, who many regard as Hart's intellectual successor, now occupies in the an annals of jurisprudence. It's interesting that unlike Hart or their fellow logical or le legal positivist, Hans Kelsen, Raz devoted relatively little attention to international law. I'm eager to hear from our panelists as to why they think this was the case and how his ideas might nevertheless be applied to international legal problems. 
He certainly thought a great deal about those problems. In accepting the Tang Prize in 2018, he spoke about the universi universality of the rule of law as a way of uniting cultures that otherwise differ, providing a crucial framework for mutual toleration and cooperation. I think it would be hard to find a better summation of the aspirations of an international legal system. It is now my pleasure to give the floor to our moderators, Adil Haq of Rutgers University and Barshak Etkin of Université Paris Panthéon Assas. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to everyone who's here with us today because it's our pleasure to be hosting this event. Uh, entitled Joseph Frost in International Law, An Unfinished Journey, uh, co-organized, as said, by ASEL's International Legal Theory Interest Group and Borderland Jurisprudence Podcast. As you all know, uh, we lost the legendary Joseph Frost on the 2nd of May this year. He does not need much introduction, and I think I cannot uh, do um, much better than Marx, but he was the one of the, or if not the most influential contemporary philosopher and during a half a century long career, he produced countless books, articles, essays, most notably Practical Reason and Norms, The Authority of the Law, and The Morality of Freedom. But unlike, as Mark said, other influential legal philosophers before him, Joseph Raz left very few writings that deal with jurisprudential questions of international law. Why is that? And this is the question at the heart of today's discussion. Hello, everyone. Uh, when I heard of Raz's passing, I thought of this passage from the preface to the second edition of The Authority of the Law. Uh, so Raz wrote that uh, his books all feel like stages in a journey. There is never a terminus. There are merely temporary resting points along a never-ending route. With every step of the journey, new destinations come into view, and the journey becomes more challenging and more interesting. Raza's journey is now over, uh, but the journey of his ideas continues. And it's in that spirit that we are here today to ask where we can take his ideas next uh, or to develop new ideas in opposition to his. Uh, both are ways of honoring his life and work. So this is a personal anecdote, but I was speaking to my mom about organizing this event and I explained to her who Joseph Raz was and what we were doing. And when I explained to her the premise of this conference, she said, why didn't anybody ask him the question while he was alive? Which is so obvious, but now uh, unfortunately impossible. Uh, but Hopefully today um, we will come as close as we can to his answer because we have gathered great minds here together with us. Um, first of all, Samantha Besson, professor at Collège de France, chair of international institutions law. We have Vashak Chale, professor of international law at the Hertie School and co-director of the School Center for Fundamental Rights. We have Kostya Gorabets, assistant professor at University of Groningen. I would like to take a second to thank Kostya to be, for being here with us today because it's the Ukrainian National Independence Day and also the sixth month of the war. So thank you Kostya for spending your day with us. Uh, and last, obviously, but not least, Miodrag Jovanovic, Professor of Jurisprudence at University of Belgrade. We will take questions at the end. So please feel free to put your questions in the QA box during or your comments. Uh, and I think that's us off. That's great. Um, so to start us off, I thought we should give the audience a sense of what Roz did say about international law. Uh, opine a little bit about why he said relatively little about it for so long, but then wh why toward the end of his life, the last decade or so of his life, he did turn to international law and uh, gave some indications about why he was shifting his focus at that stage. Um, so Kostya, I thought I'd start with you. Uh, I know that you and I have a particular fondness for practical reason and norms, uh, which Roz published in 1975, so one of his earlier books. Um, and there is a uh, telling footnote uh, about yeah. international law. It's telling that it's a footnote, but it's also quite interesting and tantalizing, and I know it's of uh, special significance to you and Bashak. Uh, for your podcast. So set the stage for us. Uh, what was Roz talking about 
in the body of the text? And then what does he say about international law in this, in this tantalizing footnote? And what do you draw from that in terms of how he thought about international law within jurisprudence? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Adil and uh, Bashak, for organizing this and uh, for, for having me. And uh, after hearing uh, Mark's introductory words, uh, I feel, of course, saddened that I never experienced this rigorous approach that Joseph Ross had towards, uh, towards his pupils, as I was unlucky to send him my dissertation just two weeks before, before his passing, and he never had a chance to read it and to react to my well, mild criticism of his conception of authority, on which maybe I will elaborate later on today. Um, so yes, as was mentioned a couple of times already, it is interesting and telling that Ra's, for Ra's international law has never been of much interest, at least for uh, the majority of his career. And in fact, he said very little about it. And uh, that seems to be um, because of the basic assumption that he shared as many philosoph legal philosophers do, that whatever holds true for law as such, for law in general, must be by implication applicable to international law as well. So no special conceptual elaboration uh, might be necessary. Uh, he touches upon international law, of course, uh, in his later uh, publications, such as the essay, Why the State of 2017. And I think we will be coming back to that essay on multiple occasions today. Uh, but indeed, I think his most illustrative take on international law uh, is found elsewhere. And um, it is surprisingly enough, uh, the Practical Reasons and Norms, which I think is his uh, best uh, work, um, even though the uh, morality of freedom is perhaps uh, the, the, the more well-known and the more celebrated uh, work because of it, if its comprehensiveness. But I think Practical Reasons and Norms just completely remade the way that we think of, of practical reasoning and what norms are, and what they are not. And so indeed on page 150 of that book, there is an interesting footnote um, uh, about international law. So, but before I, I, I tell what he says in that footnote, he, uh, I, I just give a context of what he discusses in the main body there. So for Ra's legal systems are necessarily institutional and uh, he gives further elaboration what he means by that, that they are comprehensive, uh, that they claim to be supreme, that these are open systems, and so on and so on. But what is important for Ross is that international law for him is unsurprisingly a borderline case of law, and that sets up the tone for the entire perspective he occupies towards it. But it's interesting to draw a, a kind of a contrast here because HLA Hart obviously introduced this way of thinking about international law, that it is borderline, case of law, but at the same time, Hart offers some jurisprudential account of international law, while Ross didn't. Because for Hart, international law is a borderline case, but that meant in a sense that its peculiarities are worthy of attention. We need to look at them carefully and study them carefully to understand what it can reveal about the concept of law as such. Ross occupies a totally opposite position. He says that, well, it's a borderline case of law in a sense that its peculiarities pose no problem, no threats, no challenge for jurisprudential assumptions. So there was no use, according to him, in trying to refine jurisprudential theories because of such borderline cases. So to quote practical reasons and norms uh, in the main body, he says that when faced with borderline cases, it is best to admit their problematic credentials to enumerate their similarities and dissimilarities to the typical cases and leave it at that. That's it. In the footnote, however, he says, well, international law is a special case of a borderline case, so to speak, because it is law, but it is not institutional type of law. He does not really elaborate what he means by that uh, in the book though. Uh, and I wouldn't really change that he changed his mind about um, about international law and its status in his, in his later writings. So why the states, uh, the essay, reads as a very apologetic essay, which I think defends the jurisprudential status quo and does not invite taking international law as a kind of a concept or a phenomenon that is worthy of a systemic attention. So rather there he admits that, okay, sure, state legal systems are the central of attention. Um, they must be conceptually prioritized, but he does not really see the reasons why this prioritiz prioritization should be a matter of the past. And I think it is a bit of a problem and maybe I will elaborate on that later on uh, just to uh, give uh, others a time to, to share their thoughts. 
Uh, so yeah, practical reasons and norms kind of creates this question, okay, borderline case, not institutional, but so what? He never really elaborates in detail. Thanks so much, Kostya. And, and just to underscore though, uh, Raz begins by saying uh, that international law meets the conditions of comprehensiveness, yeah. supremacy, and openness that we expect to find in legal systems, but it lacks institutionalization. And in a way, this marks a kind of ambivalence in Raz's attitude toward international law, where he accepts its reality and even its binding force and its significance. But because it's not institutionalized, he seems not to um, uh, view it as a central concern of jurisprudence for about 25 years or so. And uh, uh, Bashak uh, uh, C, um, maybe I'll turn to you here. W what changes around 2010, 2012? Where is Raz's thinking going? Why is he uh, now turning to international law and international institutions? Um, and, and what are his initial reflections on, on um, what he characterizes as development in international affairs? Ashok, uh, yeah, great. That's you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hello everyone. This is the most unusual situation of having two Bashaks uh, on a panel. And of course, when Adil said Bashak and it's a Zoom program, I was kind of uh, hesitating for, for a few seconds. So apologies for that pause. Uh, I, I do have an answer to that question. And it's wonderful to be on a panel uh, with Bashak. Uh, Etkin uh, as well. So um, one of the papers uh, that uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, in relation to Adil's question is actually the, the future of sovereignty uh, from 2017 and maybe offer a few reflections on that in response to that question. But before that, perhaps it's also to, um, helpful to refer to also a, quite an old footnote because uh, Kostya started with a footnote and uh, this is the footnote that I spotted in the 1971 piece of Raz called uh, The Identity of Legal uh, Systems. And it is uh, the final footnote for those who are interested uh, in, in checking that footnote out. And there, uh, in a sense, uh, it's a very much of a passing uh, kind of footnote, but Raz uh, says, you know, I'm talking about the state uh, law and a legal system, the identity of legal systems as a matter of state law. But he actually says there are other types of legal systems, such as uh, international law, uh, and even with reference to other systems like churches and, and things like that. So there's this an incredibly passing reference that um, you know, this, this idea in particular of the notion of a legal system might exist in the form of a social organization. But these are very much in passing, as, as was also initially identified perhaps in this work. And of course, this is very um, maybe characteristic of a lot of jurisprudential accounts of the uh, analytical philosophical tradition to have a, a tiny bit of international law. So perhaps you know, what Raz was just not so different from his contemporaries in, in, in short sentences and footnotes. Uh, maybe, of course, there are exceptions like um, Kelsen. So the coming back to the future of sovereignty in 2017, uh, something that struck me in this paper, and of course, thank you to Mark as well for his introduction, because every word, um, every sentence in Raz's papers matter. So uh, it's very difficult to sort of take them out of context or, or, or sort of interpret something because a lot of things are also incredibly interconnected. So, you know, when you take a few sentences here and there, of course, we might not be doing justice uh, to the coherency of the flow of, of these papers very carefully. So I do recognize that risk when we kind of go and, and you know, look at footnotes and snippets and, and various sentences. With that caveat in mind, uh, the, the sentence that uh, struck me is that uh, in the future of sovereignty, Ross says, uh, my, my aim uh, in this paper is to examine the general case for rethinking legal theory in the light of the erosion of the post-Westphalian doctrine of state sovereignty. So I think this as a standalone um, statement uh, is, is helpful uh, and it's a, it's a way of us understanding uh, that Raz uh, really starts to think that we need to think about not just international law, but actually the general case about legal theory 
in the light of certain developments in the international legal system. So it's a very interconnected uh, way. So I don't read it as Raz says, okay, let me just look a little bit at international law now. I've done everything else. And here's a bit of international law, but I kind of actually see it as a continuation uh, of uh, thinking about legal theory. Uh, but of course, he makes this very strong uh, assertion that he discusses in the paper about the erosion. And a couple of things that seems to interest him the most in this paper is what I think he calls, uh, and I'm very careful with these words, is the uh, sort of the undeniable presence of external authorities. Um, international courts, he mentions the EU in particular, the WTO, uh, perhaps in passing um, regional human rights courts may be read into that. And he thinks that this is a very important problem that there are external um, authorities uh, because there are also internal authorities, which is a really important part of his own account of, of law's authority. And this uh, almost enables Raz to enter into this dialogue about how do I make sense of the internal and what he takes as, as a given case of the external authorities. So I think this is what really prompted him uh, to think. Um, there is a couple of, again, really, really brief lines about his account of traditional international law, which might be disappointing to a lot of lawyers. He says a little bit of morals, customs, and a few treaties, and no supranational authorities, right? Uh, but he says the erosion of sovereignty has, has changed that a little bit. Um, so this is uh, where I, I'd like to leave it, that I think this is the particular sort of uh, problem, what he calls the erosion of uh, post-Westphalian doctrine through the rise of international institutions, precisely, that prompts him uh, to think about international law, I think as a continuation of his general understanding or approach um, to law. That's perfect. Thank you so much. And and Samantha, why don't you pick up from there? Um, Raz is viewing what he sees as the rise of international institutions and authorities and how they're interacting with state legal systems. Um, how does this change his uh, perspective on the aims of legal theory? And how does he start to see the relationship between state legal systems and uh, international law in his sort of final years? Thanks, Adil, and thanks, Bashak, the first Bashak, Bashak Hitkin, for the invitation. And it's um, so nice to be here and, and meet or see some of you again. Um, before I respond directly to your question, Adil, let me maybe add to the thread that has just been started by Kostya and Bashak, um, which has been very interesting. Um, let me add that I actually would like to qualify a bit what's been said. I mean, I know this string of works, and there are more than seven publications published and unpublished on international law by RAS today, which is, you know, quite a lot. Um, I'd like to say that this late string of publications on international law by RAS um, is actually quite amazing. Um, so yes, maybe it's not as much as one would have wanted, and maybe it came late, but it's extremely, extremely interesting. And it's not only interesting for international legal theory and for theorists like us, but it's extremely interesting for domestic jurisprudence or jurisprudence to court and to read Raz's work in general. Um, he's used those incursions and discussions of sovereignty, legitimacy, democracy, to refine his account of legitimate authority to revise his own account of the institutional dimension of law and legal systems, that was Kostya's question. I think there's a lot there to learn about what he now or what he then, you know, at the end of his life, thought of the institutional dimension of law, of the relationship between legitimacy and sovereignty. So um, I, I find this work not only fascinating for our own purposes as international lawyers, but extremely interesting uh, in terms of, of, of jurisprudence uh, to court. And I must say that knowing his work and comparing those uh, recent publications on international law with earlier work, um, I find him extremely candid and honest about you know, what he's doing and why he's doing it. And in the Why State paper, uh, which is you know, a fantastic paper, I think he's, he's really not shying away from the hardest of questions 
on statehood and why statehood matters and what it amounts to uh, exactly. And also in terms of methodology, um, if you look at how he deals with the yet unknown change and how he addresses this in analytical jurisprudence, I, I find this also um, quite, quite amazing. And so I wanted to say that. Um, on a personal, on you know, something quite personal in his own biography, I, I always wondered about why he didn't go back so much to Kelsen later in his life, and especially in his work on international law. And that's a connection I think we can maybe make later on in the conversation because um, we talked about Hart and and and, and, um, and Raz at the beginning of our conversation today, but. I think Kelsen and, and Raz, that would be also very interesting. And one further point I want to make before going um, to the actual um, why the state paper, as you asked me to, Adil, is that we've been discussing today as if, you know, Raz came late and, you know, it's a shame. And, you know, as I said, I, I don't I don't agree and I don't endorse this uh, assessment. But I, I want to say that we've been late. Um, the international legal theory community <laughs> came very late to analytical jurisprudence and to normative jurisprudence, uh, to court. I mean, obviously, you know, there's been a lot of it, uh, pre-war, post-war, um, but, it, you know, honestly, there's been a huge gap in terms of normative um, legal theory and international legal theory. So uh, I think we should also be um, a little more self-reflexive about the state of our own reflection about those questions about statehood, legitimacy, um, and um, sovereignty at the time he started writing about them. And there's, in any case, been very little interest, I think, um, among international legal theorists, including normative ones, for domestic jurisprudence. I mean, it remains largely separated, uh, maybe because of the wealth of information and knowledge you need to have on international law to be able to produce good international legal theory. but. Certainly, if we want to address some of the issues Joseph Raz has been so good at addressing, which is legitimacy, sovereignty, uh, if we want to address them in the future properly, which is one of the questions we'll be discussing later today in the discussion, uh, we need to do this hand in hand with um, domestic jurisprudence who carry on thinking about you know, those, those questions. And that's, I think, uh, a very important thing to say. So now turning quickly to the way the state uh, chapter, which is probably going to be discussed by everybody uh, today. Um, I think uh, chronologically it comes before the why the future of state sovereignty. So maybe we should have started with this one because okay. um, the future of state sovereignty is, you know, just, you know, a focus on, on sovereignty, but, you know, the groundwork is, is done in, in the why the state a chapter. It's, I think, extremely interesting for the reasons I mentioned before, because it enables Joseph Raz to go over um, questions of um, what are rules, what is specific about legal rules and legal systems and how institutionalized are they and how do we understand the institutional dimension. Um, I, I won't summarize the, the, the chapter here because it's, it's, it's too complex um, and it stems from his Kellogg lecture where you know, he did he kind of set the, the program for, for this. Um, well, but just to remind everybody about um, what, what he does in this paper, um, he questions, or at least tries to understand whether we've been right to consider uh, that the state um, was one of our central institutions in our social and legal practice, and whether we've been right to give him give it, give the state center stage in in our in our theory. So that's a very interesting discussion per se. But he also adds a second discussion to it, which is. How should we then now reflect on that centrality, knowing what we know about the internationalization of law and the internationalization of our institutions? Um, and the answer, um, as we all know, um, is surprising. So not only does it say, yes, the state has been central and it's been um, good so, uh, but it should remain uh, central um, and it will probably remain central in the future because nothing in the international law and institutions we have at the moment uh, is actually giving us signs um, of um, its being able to supersede uh, and uh, even gives um, various reasons for this. And I, I, I found this you know, 
this is why I think it's one of my favorite papers among the papers discussed today, because I find the way he addresses all those questions without shying away from any of them, uh, step by step, um, extremely um, valuable. I suppose there are a few issues we could quibble with. I don't know if you want them want me to keep them for the authority discussion. I think that's probably wiser. Sure. Yeah, let's, let's okay, so leave them for that. Yeah. So let's go back to controversies and our disagreements with yep. some of the assessments, maybe for the later discussion. Yeah, that sounds great. Good. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Samantha. So first of all, I, I really appreciate you challenging some of the the way we that uh, Bashak and I have kind of framed the discussion. I think that that's all very well taken. Um, and also, I really appreciate you um, shifting the focus from Ross to us as an intellectual community and our our responsibility for both what we've been doing and, and what we should be doing uh, going forward. So I really appreciate uh, both of those uh, both of those themes. Um, Midrag, uh, when you look at the arc of Raz's thinking about international law, what do you see? Where is the continuity? Where is the change? Uh, and what do you make of his uh, his later work uh, on on these topics? Uh, let me first of all thank you for for this uh, invitation and for organizing this uh, webinar. I think it's. Uh, highly important and I uh, think that uh, it already proved so far that it will uh, it will be interesting but uh, I really think that we do uh, need to give something to Basha Katkin's mother as a, as a response or at least as a hint uh, as a guess or uh, in Razi's own words in this last papers as a speculation why he uh, left uh, uh, so long uh, outside of, of this, the sphere of international law. So my, my academic uh, uh, part really crossed only once with Raz at, uh, on McMaster, for, uh, for 2014 McMaster Legal Philosophy Conference, the legacy of Ronald Dworkin. And there was a, a small crew of three of us from Belgrade. And we did have some nice encounters with him. And as you can uh, expect I'd tried immediately afterwards to to send him an email and to to call him to for some lecture into Belgrade, and then he responded uh, very swiftly, albeit in the negative. And there is this sentence in the email, which I found very interesting and maybe as a kind of a germ for the answer that I want to provide. And I quote this sentence. I do not think that I could give a few lectures to students which will make much sense to them. I'll be making assumptions and raising issues that do not relate to their studies and cannot be properly, uh, uh, properly absorbed by them. Uh, now, making assumptions and raising issues is clearly a philosopher's job. Uh, quite the opposite lawyers uh, is to win or solve the the case. And despite the green law, uh, Raz was first and foremost philosopher. And uh, we all know that from, from his, uh, his writings, but there is one uh, uh, rather nice passage in uh, uh, 1988 uh, symposium on Raz's work in Southern California Law Review. And in the very personal forward, Martin Leon Levine asks, what would he be if he were not a philosopher? And instead of answering himself, he offers a Raz's closest friend quotation and response, which was, it is impossible to think of him not being a philosopher. Uh, and in indeed, throughout the, the career, his primary interest was primarily in philosophical concepts like freedom, value, authority, practical uh, reasoning. And of course, these uh, concepts uh, might be crucial for the successful elucidation of legal phenomenon, but they are by no means indispensable for a skillful uh, practicing of law. And uh, for Raz, for legal philosophy was only a branch of, of a general philosophy, likewise uh, political philosophy. And thus, unlike other legal positivists, he did not have a problem with presenting uh, legal and political and moral philosophy merged in uh, uh, literally in, in, uh, in the same book, like in Morality of Freedom, for instance. Uh, so I suspect that the area of international uh, rules of conduct uh, in which primary agents are states, uh, in which power politics, diplomatic skills uh, 
historical contingencies play equally relevant part uh, of international relations has been for quite some time uh, deemed by Rice as uh, uh, significantly removed from philosophical uh, from philosophical discussions. Simply put, uh, my sense that uh, uh, he kind of thought of uh, international law as being too technical in certain aspects and uh, something which uh, uh, he should not uh, deal with. But then again, uh, first open remark that he was uh, uh, quite wrong about uh, putting aside not only him but legal theory as such, as jurisprudence as such, was uh, came as as is already said in in why the state uh, in in which he openly in which he openly said that exclusive concentration on state law was it now turns out never justified and is even less justified today. Uh, of course, uh, it's a big question mark why and at which point he realized that. But uh, again, again, my guess would be that uh, things went that far and the globalization process was uh, obvious to him as well. And this, this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, relations between the national law and international law and evil uh global or supranational law uh, were so so evident that uh, he simply could not uh, 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 could not uh, disregard uh, uh, this phenomenon and uh just a brief remark since we did not mention that uh that basically his first encounters with uh, with international law came with the field of uh, uh human rights law uh with the two articles on on, on human rights. And the first one was in uh, at the IVR Beijing conference. It was an opening uh, uh, opening plenary lecture in 2009, which was afterward, afterwards published in 2010. And then it was uh, again supplemented by, by the contribution to Samantha's and John Tassiola's groundbreaking study on philosophy of international law. And I mentioned this for one specific reason, which I will uh, turn back when we uh, open the more substantial questions about uh, uh, his philosophizing about international law. Uh, in both these uh, papers, uh, the key starting point for him was state sovereignty. So it was none of his familiar concepts from, from his, uh, to use the words of Bashak Chali, uh, conceptual baggage. Uh, None of those uh, concepts, but state sovereignty, and uh, I will I will have to say something about uh, this uh, in in my kind of uh, uh, comment uh, primarily on the future of state sovereignty because I think it's more uh, kind of uh, uh, there is more meat in the future of sovereignty than in wider state. So our second question is about uh, how Raz understood law and legal systems uh, and whether international law fits or fails to fit that understanding. And Professor Jovanovic, you were speaking about how he was a philosopher first. Uh, and I'm wondering what you think the question for the, the answer, sorry, for this question is, and does his philosopher role played, um, well, does this philosopher um, identity played more of a role uh, in that? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, there, there is one point that why the state uh, in uh, at which he kind of laconically says that his theory of authority applies to international bodies as well. But not only that he does not further elaborate this, uh, this claim, but as I said, in the future of state sovereignty, he seems to provide a completely different framework for discussing problems of international authority and legalization of international uh, relations. And uh, I will try to pinpoint just a, a couple of things which I consider to be most relevant. First, the metho methodological uh, uh, remark. In both of these papers, Arazi is in the business of uh, turning back to his words, making assumptions and raising issues uh, 
but he oscillates between uh, philosophical tasks of conceptual analysis and normative evaluation. He's kind of uh, jumping from one to another uh, without much of the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, stringent uh, 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 allocation of the two of the two tasks. But uh, what is what was a, a kind of a, a common mark for both papers was that uh, he labeled them themselves uh, as a speculation. Uh, he even called it a speculative analytical uh, jurisprudence. So uh, this is something about uh, how he perceived the subject of his philosophizing as something which is in a kind of a state of flux. He uses the word emerging. He uses a lot of, uh, of the trends, uh, development. So something which is uh, kind of not in the uh, uh, shape enough to be a properly uh, philosophically uh, uh, established or, or uh, not something which uh, you can provide a full account, uh, full account of. Uh, but more importantly, as I said, uh, he uh, kind of start from the uh, concept of state, state sovereignty. And uh, he first provides the absolutist version uh, of state sovereignty, which is uh, in his uh, um, words has some sort of a double immunity from the external authorities and from some other internal authorities. And uh, he contrasts this idea of absolute sovereignty with the world government. So these are two kind of a radically uh, uh, opposite uh, uh, poles. And then in between, we have something which is kind of today's world of a limited sovereignty in which we have the role for international uh, uh, organizations and for legalization of international relations. But then the que question is under what conditions? And then he provides some sort of a normative framework because he said this, we should not think of that as some sort of spontaneous process, but we should provide some sort of a a normative guidance for, for, for this process. But uh, then again, uh, we have completely uh, kind of a, a, a new uh, angle from which Raz uh, approaches this, these problems. Uh, he introduces a, a familiar and well-known distinction between de facto and legitimate authority. But unlike, for instance, in the authority uh, uh, of law, in which he says that the primacy is uh, should be given to legitimate authority. Here, he basically discusses de facto authority. And he is very explicit saying, if I'm not specifically mentioning, I'm thinking of de facto authorities. Uh, then he introduces another condition, which is a concept that we did not have uh, before in his writings emphasize, and this is a principle of subsidiarity. And he says that uh, in order for in, uh, international institutions to be legitimate, uh, they should fulfill the principle of subsidiarity, which is yet again not enough. And then he switched to two other conditions. One uh, is that uh, they should pass the test of uh, 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 being instrumentally valuable in terms of providing certain services uh, to the uh, subject. Uh, and then he finishes with, uh, uh, again, a, a bit a different conceptual touch that we did not have in, in his other writings, saying that uh, apart from this uh, uh, instrumental value, we should also think of uh, those institutions having intrinsic value. How can they have intrinsic value? And what does it mean for a, a, uh, any kind of a political society to have uh, intrinsic value? Then we come uh, at the field of what Raz uh, says are the, uh, the ideas of loyalty, of generating loyalty and solidarity among the subjects within a a political society. And he asks himself whether 
uh, international institutions, any of the international institutions at this point can claim to have this intrinsic value, thereby generating loyalty and solidarity of subjects. And uh, he's very skeptical about that. And he says that we should think of it as some sort of a quite distant uh, goal. But for him, this is the only way for uh, for international institutions to acquire the status of legitimate authorities. This is a really rough sketch of these ideas, but I, I think there are quite a number of things that can be discussed. But for me, it was important to show that uh, this paper, uh, it's probably telling that it was not published anywhere. It's only online, as far as I know. It is not published either as an article in a journal or as a, as a, a, a contribution to a certain volume. And probably Raz hesitated with, with, with its publication, but uh, at least it shows that Raz himself did not believe that he can simply transpone his conceptual baggage device for municipal law to the international, uh, uh, international field. Whether he succeeded or not, that's a completely different question. And I don't have time for this, but I just wanted to show that uh, he was doing uh, a, quite a different business when interfering with international law. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mirdrag. I, I am mindful of the time. So what I think we may want to do is invite panelists who want to continue on with this question about uh, Raza's theory of law and its application to international law, um, and, and then turn immediately to the question of authority, which has already been raised, and which I know folks have strong feelings about. So, um, Kostya, would you like to pick up on this theme, and then I'll, I'll switch to uh, Bashak and Samantha, uh, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course, absolutely. And um, I, I have some thoughts on, on both of these questions. So both on his idea of uh, legality and legal system and on authority, of course. And um, so it's interesting that one of the most important insights that Ross gave to jurisprudence comes from his very first book, The Concept of a Legal System. And uh, uh, since uh, Kelsen was already uh, mentioned, I think we couldn't, uh, uh, we could not not do that. Um, there he made a very bold uh, claim uh, about what legal systems are uh, and how they how they work in contrast to Kelsen, right? Because um, he says that, well, legal philosophy normally assumes that it is enough to define the concept of law and that the concept of legal system sort of requires no elaboration. Um, but he claimed that it's actually, in fact, the other way around. Uh, so no concept of law can be comprehensively discussed unless there is an understanding what constitutes uh, a legal system. There he also gave three most important and general features of, of a legal system. So he says that uh, the law is necessarily normative, institutionalized and coercive, right? So it is normative in the sense that it is served to guide human conduct. It is institutionalized in the sense that its application and modification are to a large extent performed and regulated by institutions. And it is coercive uh, in that obedience to it and its application are somehow guaranteed ultimately by the use of force. But what struck me most in that book was the idea that legal systems are not systems of norms as Kelsen argued, but system of laws. And this is a very interesting and I think very fruitful shift for international law. So Raz offers a, a radically different theory of individuation, uh, which was in some way a continuation of what uh, Bentham developed, but with much more further reaching implications. So by saying that legal systems are systems of laws and not norms, Raz insisted that in any legal system, there are necessarily laws that are not norms, right? So according to Ross, for instance, permissions, uh, power conferring rules, rules uh, uh, that uh, granting rights are not norms in, in, in strict sense of the word that he defines in the practical reasons and norms. So I will not attempt to recreate his very rigorous and complicated analysis in the concept of a legal system here, uh, but I brought all this up because I think Ross's view of a legal system and especially this concept of normativity um, that it implies is largely underappreciated in international legal theory. So for instance, there is this 
strange insistence in international legal theory, especially when it comes to soft law, that any law is necessarily normative, period. Right? So if it's, if it's not normative, it cannot, it cannot be law. So it cannot be more or less binding. It can only be binding. And when it's not, it is not law. Um, it goes very much against the observed practice. And in international law, we quite often encounter what Raz is calling these special types of laws that are not norms. And I find this, this to be a fascinating concept, fascinating concept that really needs to be developed in international legal theory, which is in, in, incredibly fruitful because it shows in, in, in a very interesting way that normativity, or, and specifically normativity of law, is a systemic quality. It is not a quality of separate entities that we find within the law, because there isn't much value in saying that, well, legal norms are normative. I mean, obviously they are normative because they are norms. But by shifting the focus on the systemic qualities, he invites us to reconsider the internal relations between different parts of the law. Right? So there are laws that are norms, and obviously no legal system could exist without norms that prescribe conduct, that uh, constitute sanctions, that are exclusionary reasons to begin with. Um, and I think we'll turn that to that concept later on. But there are also other aspects of legality that are not necessarily normative, but which play a crucial role in how we practice, how we study, and how we perceive the law. And that we shouldn't simply cast those away simply because they are not normative. We should rigorously study those and exploit these internal systemic connections uh, that exist within legal systems. And for international law, that is specifically acute, I think, because of how volatile international legal normativity is, right? So we have this gaps of normativity and some strong cases of normativity. And there is this discussion about relative normativity that was pretty hot some 15, 20 years ago, but it, it, it feels like it, it's coming back again now on the wave of, uh, of Hugh Scogan's uh, talks. Uh, so yeah, so that, 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 that's what I wanted to say about, about Raz's view of legal system and how it can be fruitful for, for international law. Although of course there are many issues with his view uh, that maybe I'll, I'll I'll talk about later, especially when it comes to to, to his theory of authority, as necessarily implied within his concept of uh, legal system. As uh, Bashak Chola has quite literally written the book on authority, and we've been going around uh, round and round uh, about this topic, uh, I want to invite you to now share your thoughts, please, Professor Chola. Thank you, Boishak. When you call me, then I don't get confused about, <laughs> about the order. Um, so uh, let me just say a few words uh, on, 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 on this, especially, you know, when maybe the, also the discussion that Miodrax started with the future of, uh, of sovereignty a little bit as well. So in a way, um, the moves that, um, justificatory moves that Raz uh, makes in that paper in, in thinking about uh, you know, various authority relationships um, made a lot of sense to me. Uh, so I thought that there was no other way that he could have gone in a way, given how he understood or he developed a service conception of authority in the, in the, in the first place. So let me just give a few reasons why I think it, it makes sense, it's coherent uh, of, of his general account of, of authority. Um, so I think the first issue is that uh, Raz's account of the authority of law really has to do with trying to justify the authority of law over individuals. And I think this is a really important, it's a really important, for me it is incredibly important, and these are individuals who already have moral reasons uh, to act or, or not to act, uh, and they're capable of guiding their actions through moral reasoning, and he's really trying to uh, give, and uh, not trying to succeed it, I think in many ways, offers an account of why uh, those reasons should be replaced, why these moral reasons should be replaced uh, through laws claim to, to authority. And this is uh, the, the service uh, conception or the instrumental account of uh, the authority of law. But when we think about international law and international laws authority, you could take that route perhaps and say, well, you know, the, the, the task is to 
justify the law's authority over individuals as well, international law's authority. We, we, I, I think we can do that. I mean, that, that can be a road that can be taken. Um, and I, I think that probably is fine. But of course, as international lawyers, we know that there are pockets of areas, maybe in international laws of armed conflict or a few other areas where this may be very fitting. But usually we are trying to justify the authority of international law over state officials who already have domestic legal reasons to act in some way. Does that make sense? I mean, of course, the officials might also have moral reasons, but they also have domestic legal reasons or legals from state law. And then we're thinking about how to justify international laws authority over those who already have legal reasons. So it's about replacing certain legal reasons uh, with international legal reasons on probably on some occasions. So that's why he's sort of really, uh, you know, uh, indicating really, right? I mean, not really saying a huge amount on this idea of subsidiarity uh, as, as a way of trying to make sense of uh, international laws, claims to authority and domestic laws or domestic constitutions claims to authority, to me made a lot of sense that, that I think of all uh, legal theorists, he seemed to be the most likely <laughs> to go down uh, in that route. And I think it also uh, is very valuable uh, uh, way, way of thinking. And I think that kind of work, I think going back to um, Sam Samantha's earlier points is also quite significant uh, for, uh, for sort of thinking about domestic jurisprudence and decision-making about you know, why uh, international law should matter in, in that kind of domestic reasoning. And, and you mentioned the book on the authority of international law, and this is exactly kind of the, the problem uh, uh, that I was interested in, that why would domestic judges um, you know, uh, take international law's supreme authority rather than the authority of their own domestic laws? Um, so I think the flow was in that direction. And I think this is one of the areas I wish he had written uh, more uh, and further. Professor Hassan. Yes, thanks. There's so much to say, and we'd like to react to everything that's been said by our previous uh, speakers and colleagues. So it would be so nice to be around a table. I think it would be a little more spontaneous, but um, thank you so much. Um, maybe just a quick reply to Neil Drag. Um, the Future of State Sovereignty has been published in the Zadorsky Walton book. So it's obviously it's a, an online paper on his website, but it's been it's been published in 2017, I think. Um, and also what's very interesting to read, I think, with the future of state sovereignty paper, if one is interested like us in um, the institutional dimension of um, the legitimate authority of international law, is the democratic deficit paper. This is clearly unpublished. That's also on his website. And that comes back to some of those questions, Mildrag, and I, I think it's uh, it's probably you know, a good companion to um, so reading both papers together, I think is, is, is really attractive. So let me now go back to the questions that were posed to us um, about law and legality um, in, in Raz's recent work on, on international law. And I won't go back to what Kostya said, because I, I thought that was very, very, very interesting. And, um, so I won't go back to normativity, but I think this is really something to to take to take on. And what he says in um, why the state, when he revisits uh, his whole theory of, of, of law and institutions, I think is is absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, so on on law and legality in in Raz's recent work of international law, I think the couple of other things we can um, grab along the way. Um, for instance, in his Tan lectures, in, in the published version of the Tan lectures, he has this interesting phrase uh, when he defines the rule of law. He says the rule of law applies to all laws, um, but he does note that international law is special uh, in the sense that it applies to more than one organization at the same time, to more than one social organization at the same time. So he kind of leaves it open um, to you know, what, what kind of understanding the rule of law one should have in international law. And I think what he seems to be endorsing is the kind of joint rule of law 
theories than one sees recently published um, in, in, in different books. So that's, I think, an interesting passage or phrase one should um, look at. Uh, another very interesting one is, um, uh, I think, um, is um, the one on um, whether international law needs to be regarded as a unified system or not, and whether this matters for his arguments. And interestingly, he says it doesn't. And I thought that was kind of relevant. Uh, and this goes along the lines of what Kostya was telling us. You know, there's a lot we can we can learn from what he wrote recently about international law, about normativity, as Kostya said, but also about systematicity and how it matters or not for legitimacy. Um, so now let me come to um, legitimate authority. Uh, because if, if, if Raz does say many times in the different papers we are observing today, the seven papers we are assessing in this single conversation, one thing that comes a lot is that, you know, he applies uh, the same concept of law to international law as the one he does, you know, in general, which is, is universal and general concept of law. And he does the same for legitimate authority, as been said before. So he, you know, he says that nothing excludes um, international institutions and international law from um, claiming legitimate authority along the same lines uh, as domestic institutions and domestic law would, uh, or any law for that matter. So the conditions are the same for him. But he does stress a couple of times that not only do they not often claim to have that authority, and that's interesting, um, but also that you know the conditions are you know not necessarily fulfilled as often as. Uh, they, they should. So that's his way out, right? So he it's the same it's the same package, the same envelope. But you know, still <laughs> the specificities come, you know, in the detail and whether it's actually claimed and whether it's fulfilled. And then as Miodrag said before, comes all this discussion of loyalty and um, communal self-rule and value pluralism, which kind of qualify everything that was said before. And I think this is extremely interesting and it would be great if we could come back to value pluralism at the end of our conversation um, today. Um, so I won't come back to de facto authority because I, I agree with Miodrag on this. I think this is very, very interesting. And also he has this discussion on content independence in the colleague lecture, in the Kellogg lectures, which is you know, kind of really, really interesting too. Um, so like uh, Bashak, I think the, you know, for all of us who've been dealing with RAS on authority and trying to apply it to international law, I think the most surprising passage and the most reassuring, depending on which side of the fence one sits on, is his discussion on interdependent legitimacy or relative authority. He uses both terms uh, in different publications. Um, and I find this um, extremely interesting. And of course, subsidiarity is just the, part, you know, the tip of the iceberg in that context, because if you approach legitimacy in this interdependent way and authority in this relative way, as he, seemed to, as he seems to do, then obviously you need principles and subsidiarity is one of them. Uh, but as Miodrag said before, it can't be the only one, and Joseph Raz has realized this, uh, but we'll never know what the others um, could be for him, uh, but we actually know this is um, one of them. Um, before, at the beginning of my remarks, I did mention the Democratic Deficit paper, and I stress how, how, how interesting it is to read it as a companion to the Future of State Sovereignty paper. And I'd like to conclude um, this round of um, comments going back to this um, democratic deficit paper, because one of the things one rests frustrated with at the end of what the state paper, at the end of the future of state sovereignty paper is, okay, so he opens the door, but he says, well, we don't really know, you know, it's very difficult to make sure we get the kind of respect and, and loyalty and, you know, that we need that are so central for uh, an effective uh, legal system and for legality to cool. And this, he stresses this many times. But one of the potential revisions he's explored, but ruled out, is a democratic revision, a democratic reform. So obviously, uh, this is um, a very interesting paper for anyone interested in 
revisions of international institutions that would help them fit the conditions of legitimate authority uh, in, in Joseph Rass theory, and for anyone interested in democratic legitimacy and inter international institutions uh, to cool. And that paper is not published. It's obviously not finished. Um, it has a lot of potential, but also lots of, uh, of difficulties. And it would take hours to discuss it, but I think it's uh, it has uh, a couple of very interesting uh, twists. One of them is the connection to um, discussions of acceptance which are very big in international law theorists' discussions of legitimacy and subjective legitimacy in particular. So I think this is a very interesting co connection for you know, all those of, of us who work on subjective legitimacy and how we connect this to democratic legitimacy. Um, and um, the, the, the second thing that I find quite interesting in this discussion what everyone thinks about you know the, the validity of the argument um, is that he strangely enough concludes the paper by saying you know the, the, there's a gap the, there's a gap there's a lack there's a there's a deficit there that he refuses to refer to as a democratic deficit for all the reasons he makes um, but which he also kindly somehow says will be difficult to 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 fill otherwise and this is why it's an interesting paper but this is also why it's an unfinished paper um but because he's not with us today i, I think it was important to uh, to mention work that is you know in the way and because you asked us where we'd see uh, opportunities to carry joseph raz's work on international law forward um this paper i think is one that has potential to be brought forward um, by people on both sides of the fence, as I said before. So voila. Costia, would you like to uh, wrap up our discussion of, uh, of authority? Yes, uh, gladly. Uh, I have I have some some thoughts to share, especially in light of uh, what uh, Bashak and Samantha said, uh, because obviously for us, laws authorities has always been the central philosophical puzzle, uh, as we know. Um, but what is essential, and I think this is often sort of goes missing, especially in, in the context of how Raz's theory applies to international law, including the talks of this shared or relative authority and the condependent authority and so on, is that his view on authority assumes a certain institutional structure that inevitably goes back to his concept of a legal system. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, like we could reconstruct or deconstruct rather theory of authority as requiring or assuming three basic ideas. That first of all, that authority is what we use as a pedigree for legality, right? So only norms and reasons that come from authoritative source may be legal. So we use law, we use authority to identify law. Second is that authority requires agency, and this I think is the most problematic element of this theory, right? So authority for Ross, it is someone's view on what ought to be done, right? So it is necessarily someone, an agency, a natural person or, 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 or some institution, formal institution with officials and so on. And that requires the third idea, the hierarchy, right? So relations of authority are unequal and assume some functional and institutional differentiation between those in the position of authority and those subjected to this authority. And of course, in his latest, later publications in Why the State and, 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 and State Sovereignty, he does recognize that, yeah, of course, my theory of authority applies to international institutions as well. And that is true. I mean, of course, we can, we can speculate and we can discuss how well all those international institutions had to satisfy normative and non-normative conditions of authority, when we speak of uh, EU law or EU bodies, United Nations Security Council or WTO and so on and so on and so on. So there, there is no problem. But the thing is, and that, that I think is the problem with Raza's theory of authority, that all this institutional um, element or institutional dimension represents only a fraction of international law. Right? So what about customer international law? Does it claim any authority in international? Does it claim any authority as law? So Raz is sort of, silent on the matter because in his earlier works in relation to custom whenever he discusses custom the authority of custom is always secondary in relation to authority of custom applying bodies so such as courts 
And so he occupies position in the break with heart, by the way, that courts turn customs into law when apply those customs to solve legal disputes. So he sort of occupies this legal realist position, so to speak. So while Raz's theory of authority can be more or less painlessly applied to international institutions, it does not feel fit well, I think, to international law as such, because it remains largely unmediated by institutions, especially when we speak of custom international law, but also about treaties, bilateral treaties, multilateral treaties that do not create any special agencies or bodies, and therefore do not create any hierarchical relations or agencies, um, his theory remains problematic. But I think there is a way of rethinking his theory of authority to make that work. Uh, perhaps I will have something to say about, uh, about that later on at the end of our discussion, but this is just uh, to, to, to put some, some ideas of his into the perspective. Thank you, Kostya. So we have at least a couple of people who are quite specialists, uh, which would be the least to say, in international human rights law. So I'm wondering, as Ross came to write uh, more and more uh, about human rights uh, later in his life, um, I'm going to turn to you, Professor Chella, what was his theory of human rights law and what was what has been its impacts and its merits? Thank you, Bashak. I, I have to impose a lot of time limits uh, on, on these questions because there's quite a lot of layered uh, things to talk about. Um, Raz has uh, written um, two papers, uh, probably more, but two important ones in 2007 on human rights without foundations, and then in 2009 on the human rights in the emerging world order. And I, I'm going to make uh, refer to those, even though they're tiny, you know, not very long papers, there's quite a lot of things. And then there's also the reply that he wrote to Waldron um, uh, as well on human rights, I think legal and more of a political book that um, uh, we, we also looked at. So a few a very short pieces of writings, but actually they're incredibly important. They're incredibly complex, full of new ideas, uh, as well as uh, taking some very important positions in a lot of the existing debates on it. But perhaps the most important to th thing to say is that Raz uh, explicitly says he doesn't write on human rights law, and he wasn't trying to work out a theory of human rights law, he says, you know, that he writes, uh, uh, I mean, his focus was really what he called human rights practice, uh, which by which he means international uh, human rights uh, practice. And, uh, and it is not necessarily a legal practice, though he does refer to the practice having a lot of legal elements, but the word practice kind of makes it a lot more wider than just talking about human rights law as such. So it's a very unique, it's a very particular thing. And of course, even this discussion of what is human rights practice and how do we make sense of it and what has Raz contributed, these are really important, even on the very definitional uh, fields. I think uh, we, can, we can talk about that uh, quite a lot. So he, in his work on human rights practice, and of course he also says, I'm not working on human rights and that's really important. So. He says, I'm not trying to create a moral theory or, you know, I'm not working at, you know, to look at um, a moral account of human rights either. So there are many uh, important, I think, things that have, have had impact and could have more and more impact. But I'm just going to pick a couple uh, and just to say that this is incredibly non-exhaustive uh, in, in, in that regard. So I think the first uh, kind of thing that, that we see is that Raz has taken a, a position in a, in a kind of a very kind of happening debate within, uh, within human rights theory. So I think this is what he's most well known for because he was identified as falling under what you may call a political conception uh, of, of, of human rights rather than a naturalistic or a moral kind of uh, conception. So, you know, obviously if Raz falls into a debate, right? And there's a debate between two camps and Raz is on, on one hand, obviously this is very impactful because you would want to know what are his reasons in, in, in actually defining a political conception of human rights. So maybe that's one thing we can identify. But I think the, uh, the, the, the second, and I think uh, perhaps a more interesting uh, thing uh, that, that is really important is how Raz really arrives. So how he defends his version of, of this political uh, 
account of the of the human rights practice, uh, because uh, he 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 makes some very important distinctions in that regard, and I uh, think these should have um, a lot more impact because people were more like, oh, you know, oh, he's in this camp, and you know, there are the others on the other camp, and I think maybe much have been discussed about that. So what I find very interesting about these two uh, papers in particular on human rights without foundations is that he actually says there are a lot of, of human rights. Uh, so human rights can be claimed against international organizations, against other international agents, perhaps corporations. Human rights can be claimed against domestic institutions as well. So this is a very broad, a very expansive understanding of the word uh, human rights. But he says that what uh, is really interesting or what is really significant is that we try to create a normative account of uh, the significance of what he calls the human rights practice, that is the practice about human rights that takes place in the international arena or in international affairs. So he says, you know, people may use a lot of these things, but I'm offering you a very particular, uh, you know, sub-segment, you know, this is, this is where I'm interested in what happens with human rights. So this kind of saying human rights are happening in a lot of places, but we can actually slice and differentiate between what happens with human rights in, you know, in domestic law, in IOs, in corporate and this, that, and to look at their function in international affairs, um, I think is incredibly uh, an important contribution. He also enters into debates about human rights and says that human rights can be claimed against lots of different agents. So not just against states, right? But he says, the most interesting thing we have to look at is how, what is the significance of these in international affairs or in international law? So maybe coming a really big circle from where we started, uh, Raz's uh, contributions to understanding the human rights practice really ties in with his contributions in understanding state sovereignty, uh, because he thinks that these two are uh, incredibly uh, closely connected and they're they are in this sort of an interdependent uh, or uh, relationship. So these are just the very beginnings. I'm sure there's more uh, that people will add, uh, but I think his, uh, his impact has been about, uh, I think maybe the initial impact is, oh, wow, Raz is on the political uh, conception side. But I think we have to read these papers a lot more carefully uh, to actually uh, uh, to 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 really survey more systematically um, his contributions, in particular, uh, you know, his his work in trying to define something called the human rights practice um, and what it means for other types of human rights and their practices in different places. Thank you so much. We were hoping to have a full round of discussion on Raz's uh, work on human rights because it, it is so, so interesting. Our time together has flown by, uh, so we're reaching the end of our, our 90 minutes. So I wanted uh, really to open the floor, but to, to invite uh, folks to reflect on where to take international legal theory next, either uh, drawing on Raz's work or reacting against it. But if there is anything that uh, you're, 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 you'd like to respond to or add to the discussion so far, uh, that, that would be uh, a fine use of time as well. Um, Samantha, would you like to uh, start us off with our, our final round? Samantha, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, Adina, I thought I wouldn't go first, so. <laughs> um, so, as I said in my opening remarks this afternoon, um, I think the international legal theory community has been very slow in getting back to normative jurisprudence. I mean, it was very strong in the 20th century, as we know, and it, you know, there have been exceptions who carried on normative jurisprudence throughout the second half of the 20th century. But it took a while for the majority of legal theorists to um, rediscover um, deal with legal theory in this way. Um, I remember being invited to contribute to a volume which was called, you know, and they invited me and I thought, okay, great, I'll contribute to a volume on international legal theory, but they invited me to contribute a chapter on moral philosophy of international law. So I think, and this goes back to some of the things Miodrag said beforehand on the importance of understanding that one of the great things Joseph Raz's work can give international law is precisely this huge breadth of topics that he brings together when he addresses international law. 
uh, normativity um, and morality in general, so he embraces international law um, without, you know, with those moral tools and moral questioning, without without shame and without problems. And I think, generally, I think this is one of the things we can take on. And if we can encourage uh, young scholars to feel at ease doing this kind of normative international legal theory, uh, that would be a wonderful way of bringing the last 10 years of Joseph Raz's work on international law um, further. Now, on specific topics, um, I've already mentioned that some of the things I really find uh, puzzling or uh, interesting uh, um, are, you know, value pluralism and what this, what, 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 it, what bringing international institutions to respect value pluralism outside human rights law, views, obviously, where we have lots of tools. Um, what would that mean exactly, and how? Would, how would be, we be able to um, um, address this and enforce this uh, without democratic legitimacy? Because he rules it out. Um, that is something you know. I, I think um, would be very interesting to uh, deepen and, and, and carry forward. Um, when I read him, he keeps repeating the same thing in, in in each conclusions to each of those papers, and that worries me. And I think this would be a great thing to to pick up. The, the second thing I, I think is we need to work on when he's really encouraging us to work on is the institutional aspects of the legitimate authority of international law. I know Kostya disagrees with me on this, but that's good. Um, I was very interested by the fact that he referred to reviving the limited state theory in the wider state uh, paper. Um, so I think, you know, who is this discussion about interdependent legitimacy is something you know many of us are working on at the moment and this is some definitely something to look forward to and Nicole Warren's work in particular is extremely groundbreaking on, on those topics um voila so and obviously this includes as I said democratic legitimacy and, and some of the questions I've addressed before but these are the three remarks I wanted to make to close thank you Thank you so much, Samantha. Uh, Miedrag, what are your uh, final reflections? Where do we go from here? Uh, I think that uh, there are some hints made by uh, Kostya in the last part of his uh, of his talk that, uh, and I I did try to to offer some of my reasons why I think that Razi's theory, uh, general theory, is inept to be literally transported. Uh, to an international field in, in, in my book on the nature of international law. And the reason for this is very simple. Uh, at this time, uh, the, the empirical premises upon which the, the theory of authority was devised for municipal law uh, does not apply, do not apply at the international field, or at least do not largely apply to the to international field. Let us not forget that these premises include in his papers, in Raz's papers, include uh, the relationship of subordination and superordination. Or uh, he explicitly says in his service conception uh, revisited paper uh, that constant based uh, theories of authority fly in the face of reality. And international law is still very much horizontal in its uh, functioning is still very much uh, a constant based uh, uh, a field of law. And in that respect, it's very difficult uh, simply to carry this conceptual baggage, which is applied to, to municipal, municipal law. And I tried to show by, by this uh, uh, small reconstruction of his argument in the future of state sovereignty that in a sense, Raz was kind of aware of this, and that's why he did not uh, choose to go and discuss international authority as such, but he started from the state sovereignty and asked uh, under which uh, conditions we could perceive development of the limitation of state sovereignty as some sort of a preferable uh, international development. So this is for me completely different, uh, uh, a different uh, uh, kind of methodological route, which requires a different uh, 
substantive uh, positions. And uh, it's really sad that he did not have uh, time to develop this uh, uh, more uh, thoroughly. But I would say that uh, there, there are elements, particularly in this paper, uh, to, be, uh, to be developed and uh, to get a more fruitful a more, more fruitful thinking on, uh, especially on the topic, on the normative uh, issue, on the normative side of the uh, legal philosophy, on the legitimacy of international international uh, uh, organization. In one of the really important uh, uh, elements is this uh, uh, value value plurality, uh, which Samantha emphasized. And just a brief reminder: maybe this was a kind of the his very first uh, encounter with the field of international law when he was writing a paper with uh, uh, Afshai Margalit on uh, national self-determination back in 1990. Uh, and uh, part of the moral justification for this right was exactly in the kind of a local ways of, of uh, pursuing uh, uh, life chances and life options, which is uh, uh, the, the same kind of thread that he that he followed in in uh, the future of sovereignty. So definitely, this is really an important element uh, 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 to be explored. Particularly, also uh, the 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 part that he mentioned about the interpretation, the interpretation in line with value pluralism, for which he took the illustration of the margin of appreciation doctrine of the. European Court of Human Rights. So these are some of the areas that uh, can be, uh, and which are already fruitfully uh, produced in line with, with Razi's thoughts uh, from the last papers. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, Kostya, what are your final reflections? Where would you like to see international legal philosophy go next? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can go so many directions from Braz because uh, in his legacy is just huge. Uh, I think someone calculated it's like 4,000 pages uh, of original material plus. So it's, 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 it's a huge legacy and many of what he wrote definitely can be used for international law. And um, I, I, I think I would disagree with Mia Drug there uh, in relation to his theory of authority. I think he was overcautious uh, with applying it to international law exactly because of the empirical assumptions that it was based upon. Uh, but I think and that's also what I try to, to, to do in my, uh, in my own writing that you could actually bypass this institutional element in his in his theory of authority because his idea of authority requires that there is someone to whom we delegate practical deliberations essentially and then we take the result of those delegated practical deliberations as content independent reasons for action right so preemptive exclusionary reasons and i think that that was the empirical assumption for him from observable structures of authority that we have in domestic law but also beyond law even just normal structures of authority and that is understandable but to me i think it is not necessary for uh, especially authority of norms to have that delegation of practical deliberation so i think you can still have largely horizontal normative structure like we have in international law to which basic ideas uh, of Ra's apply. And I think that his basic idea and his most brilliant idea is the idea of exclusionary or preemptive reasons that kind of lurks behind everything that he wrote about. Um, and that idea can be reconstructed uh, in a very fruitful way, I think, and can give us a lot of uh, uh, instruments uh, in terms of legal interpretation, legal reasoning, international law, um, uh, theory of customary international law, theory of principles, uh, use cognizance, what have you. So there is a lot of, 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 of material that we could work with if we, uh, we try to reconstruct it in a way that is consistent with his views, but also that works uh, for the practice of international law. Thank you Thanks. so much, Kostya. And having uh, having read your dissertation, I know that there, there's a lot of promise uh, down the, the road that you've just sketched for us. Uh, Bashak, the final words are for you. Um, what uh, what are your what are your your hopes for for carrying forward uh, uh, the field uh, after after Raza's loss? Well, I mean, I think um, it's very much underlined. There's so many directions one one could go, um, and I think some of the directions. 
productive directions could also be about um, critically engaging and, and perhaps pushing back on, on some of the arguments or, or trying to um, work through, you know, what if not, you know, uh, you know, uh, certain things. So I think that that also would create an immense potential for contributions of, of, of all of us to, to, to his legacy uh, as well. And perhaps one uh, idea that, uh, because I do work quite a bit on the human rights practice is, is exactly that idea that uh, the way that he defines um, human rights practice, um, whether that uh, you know whether that's a that's a sound description of what what is the so-called human rights practice, whether we have multiple human rights practices because we have very institutionalized spaces of human rights practice and less institutionalized. And what I read from Raz's papers is that his his papers are more about less institutionalized human rights practices. Uh, so you know those who work on the European or the Inter-American Court of Human Rights would find them maybe slightly counterintuitive in many ways. And so this idea of theorizing, analytically theorizing flux, and you know, where is this flux and where is this indeterminacy and where it isn't? And uh, how could one productively push back against a giant, a legal philosopher? I think those could be ways to go as well. I guess, uh, this is the point where I should be opening the floor for questions and answers, but we have unfortunately ran out of time. Uh, this only goes to show that Raz's legacy in international law is incredibly rich and the discussions will not end here, most definitely. Uh, but I'm hoping that uh, all those who had questions will reach out to the relevant people uh, I think Kostya says yes, please. <laughs> uh, we'll reach out to our generous speakers uh, to ask their questions and continue the conversation. I want to say offline, but it still might be online. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you to Azel Iltig, International Legal Theory uh, Interest Group. Um, I, I guess I should say thank you to Borderline Jurisprudence, but that's... <laughs> you can thank yourself. I think that's fine. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone. This has been an incredibly rich discussion and provided everyone with a lot of food for future thought. Uh, I hope everyone who is watching, if they haven't read uh, Roz's uh, uh, body of work, to to get started. There's there's plenty of it, and uh, and it's uh, you know it, it it's um, perhaps uh, uh, you know the greatest body of work in the history of this field, and certainly uh, up there at the at the very top. So there's. Uh, plenty, plenty to chew on, and I hope at least we've inspired you to read it and engage with it uh, critically as well as uh, developing it uh, further. So thank you all very much. Uh, this has really been a wonderful, wonderful way to spend uh, this time. <laughs>